Today we begin our video lecture series on the eukaryotic kingdoms. Today's video lecture will be discussing two of those kingdoms, Kingdom Protista and Kingdom Fungi. But we're first going to start by just a quick review of prokaryotic versus eukaryotic cells. We've talked about this a million times so far this year. Eukaryotic cells, these are the kingdoms that we're talking about. The, the major characteristics are going to be that you have the presence of a nucleus and you have a presence of those membrane-bound organelles, those more complex organelles like the mitochondria, the chloroplast, the lysosomes, the Golgi body, so on and so forth. And then, of course, you know, we talked about viruses which were teeny tiny, prokaryotes were a little bit bigger, and now we're dealing with eukaryotic cells which are much larger. So what are the kingdoms that belong to domain eukarya? There are four eukaryotic kingdoms. You're going to have your protists, your fungi, your plants, and your animals. So kingdom protista, kingdom fungi, kingdom plantae, and kingdom animalia. So how did we go from prokaryotic organisms to eukaryotic organisms? The endosymbiotic theory explains the origin or the beginning of eukaryotic cells. And basically, to summarize this theory, you're basically saying that a larger prokaryote at some point sort of engulfed a smaller prokaryote. They started living together symbiotically, and then eventually they sort of grew and divided as one organism, and those smaller prokaryotes became organelles like the chloroplast or the mitochondria or even the nucleus. And there's a lot of evidence that supports this theory because all of those things have genetic material, which of course, if they came from a living organism, they would have. So the very first eukaryotic organism, scientists think, were some sort of protist, a very simple organism that had a nucleus, um, but not a lot of complicated organelles. But we do think protists were the first eukaryotic organism, so that's the kingdom that we're going to start with. So all protists are eukaryotic. Do not think because they start with pro that they are going to be prokaryotic. The only prokaryotic organism is bacteria. Protists are not bacteria, so they are eukaryotic. So major characteristics are that they are eukaryotic, but then you pretty much have a little bit of everything else. You have unicellular protists, you have multicellular protists, you have autotrophic protists, you have heterotrophic protists, you have protists that reproduce asexually, and you have protists that reproduce sexually, which is why the nickname for this kingdom is the junk drawer kingdom. Because just like your junk drawer at home, this kingdom has sort of a little bit of everything that doesn't really fit anywhere else. So we're about on number seven on your notes organizer, so make sure you're filling that in as we go along. Um, but scientists classify protists based on how they obtain their nutrition. So using that method of classification, there are three types of protists. There are animal-like protists, which of course are like animals, they are heterotrophic. There are plant-like protists, so just like plants, they're autotrophic. And then there are fungus-like trophics, so just like fungi, they are saprotrophic, or in other words, decomposers. So if protists were our original eukaryotes, then they are the ancestors of animals, plants, and fungi, so it makes sense that there are three types of protists. So we're going to begin by talking about um, animal-like protists, but these and the protists in this picture are the ones that you are responsible for knowing. You're responsible for knowing um, the structures of an amoeba, the structures of paramecium, the structures of euglena, and then you need to know that slime molds are an example of a fungus-like protist. Okay, so we're starting with animal-like protists. Another name for animal-like protists is protozoans, which, if you look at the Greek origin, actually means first or pre-animals. You know, like zoology is the study of animals. So protozoans are animal-like protists. So what makes them like animals? It's the fact that they are heterotrophic. They, are, they have to consume um, another organism in order to obtain their energy, their nutrition. So examples of anim animal-like protists are amoebas, paramecium. The guys in this picture are called stentor. These are the largest animal-like protists. And plasmodium. Those are examples of animal-like protists. And we're going to talk a little bit about some types of animal-like protists. So there are protists like the paramecium and the stentor that are covered in these tiny little hairs called cilia. So they belong to a group called ciliates. So you can see the cilia there. And every ciliate, so paramecium is the one you're responsible for knowing, is going to have a big structure called a macronucleus and a little nucleus structure called a micronucleus. There is a category of pro animal-like protists called sarcodines, and this includes the amoeba. And amoebas move with pseudopods, which is another word for false pseudopod, which means feet, so false feet. 
And basically, their false feet are these things called um, pseudopods where you have the endoplasm which is the inner cytoplasm pushing out the thicker ectoplasm, which is the outer cytoplasm. And they sort of creep and crawl along with these pseudopods, and that's how they move. And um, that's also how they, you can see, take in, you know, like smaller particles for, at, for nutrition. So that's what's happening here. They're wrapping around this particle, whatever that is, and then um, they take it in and it becomes broken down in a food vacuole. So here are just some more animal-like protists. There are plenty that cause diseases, like the plasmodium that's carried in mosquitoes that causes malaria. There's also trypanosoma, which causes American sleeping sickness and African sleeping sickness. Not something you're really necessarily responsible for knowing, but just something interesting. Now, these structures you are responsible for knowing, so go ahead and pause on this page and copy this down on number nine on your notes organizer. Okay, these are the two animal-like protists you're responsible for knowing. So again, pause on this slide and draw your picture of an amoeba and draw your picture of a paramecium and label those structures. Okay, moving on to plant-like protists. If you hear anyone talk about algae, you know what, you've seen algae before, you know what that looks like. That is not a plant. That is a plant-like protist. So how is algae like plants? Well, the big thing, of course, is that they are autotrophic photosynthesizers, which means that they make their own food using energy from the sun. And as it turns out, um, Plant-like protists, not plants, are the ones that produce the majority of, of Earth's oxygen. They produce about 70% of Earth's oxygen. So they are very um, diverse, which makes them very difficult to classify. Here are just some types of plant-like protists. There's phytoplankton. There are diatoms, which are used as abras abrasives in your toothpaste. There are dinoflagellates, which I'll talk more about. There are euglenoids, which has the euglena. There's yellow-green algae, golden-brown algae, brown algae, which is kelp. There's green algae, which you've seen plenty of. And there's red algae, which is used even in um, sushi sometimes. So there are some pictures of some plant-like protists. Here is euglena, which you are responsible for knowing the structures of. So go ahead and pause on this video and draw your picture of the euglena and label that. And then again, you know, protists, plant-like protists, they have tons of uses. They're, they're used in food all the time. They're used in soups. They're used in sauces. They are used for thickeners and things like ice cream. Um, diatoms are specifically used in industrial oils. They're used in cooking oils. And like I already mentioned, they're used in toothpaste. At, that's what helps clean your teeth. They're, they're the abrasive parts of toothpaste. So protists, you're eating them all the time. You're using them all the time. Pretty interesting stuff. Okay, now Plant-like protists can cause these things called algal blooms. You've probably heard of the red tide before. So algal blooms are caused when food is plentiful, conditions are favorable, allowing protists called dinoflagellates to reproduce very quickly in a short amount of time. So you have these blooms of dinoflagellates. And what that does is it depletes the nutrients in the water and, and ultimately causes the food source to go down, which makes the algae die, so therefore it depletes the oxygen. And then all that algae is getting into the gills of fish and other, you know, getting on other marine organisms, actually causing them to suffocate. So an algal bloom, is, while it's great, you know, temporarily for the protists, it's actually very dangerous for the marine organisms living in that ecosystem. So the red tide is caused by when you have dinoflagellates that have red pigments to them. Okay, so last up are fungus-like protists, and what makes them fungus-like? You know, the big thing, they are decomposers. They are saprotrophic, just like fungi are. They also use spores for reproduction, which fungi do as well, but they actually have cell walls made of cellulose and not chitin like fungi, so that's a difference there. And this includes slime molds, water molds, downy mildew. Sometimes in the streams here in Georgia, you see this foamy orange-yellow stuff. Those are actually slime molds. That's a fungus-like protist. Now, they grow best just like fungi in damp, dark locations. They grow well on decaying matter because that's what they use for nutrition. They are very diverse. You see lots of different colors. You see yellow, you see orange, blue, black, red. And this um, mold, this fungus-like protus mold, was actually what caused the potato blight back in the 19th century in Ireland. 
Okay, so we are switching gears here. We are moving to kingdom fungi. So you typically think of, you know, this right here when you think of a fungus, the typical mushroom, but there actually is a lot more to this kingdom than that. So again, we're in domain eukarya, kingdom fungi. So we're dealing with all eukaryotic um, organisms here. So fungi are eukaryotic, uh, fungi are heterotrophic, they are saprotrophic, they're decomposers. You will break my heart into a million pieces if you tell me that fungi are autotrophic. They are not plants, they do not photosynthesize. They contain hyphae, so those are your three bullets in number 17. And then for number 19, they have cell walls made of this substance called chitin, which is, which is actually the same stuff that, is, that makes up the exoskeletons of arthropods. Most fungi are multicellular, but there are some single-celled fungi. Those are yeast, which you've heard of. They're sort of in a category of their own. Now here are some major fungi structures. This is not the picture you have to draw for 18. They have cell walls made of chitin. They, um, their body is made up, these, made up of these thread-like filaments called hyphae. And the main portion of a fungus is made up of net, this net-like mass of hyphae that's found under, sur under the surface or underground, and that's called mycelium. That's the main portion of a fungus. So this is what you need to draw under number 18. So here's the main portion of a fungus. Then you've got the hyphae that make up the fruiting body. And again, these they're the body of a fungus is filamentous. It's very stringy. That allows it to increase its surface area, allowing it to absorb m more nutrients all the time. Okay, again, all fungi are heterotrophs. So do they ingest and then digest, or they, do they digest and then ingest? Well, if they're decomposers, they're sending out enzymes, breaking it down externally, and then absorbing the nutrients. So they're digesting and then they're ingesting. So under number four, that's, that's what you need to put. They digest and then they ingest. They produce enzymes and then break down organic matter, allowing the nutrients to be absorbed. So there are three ways that fungi obtain nutrition. And they can be one of these things, or they can be all of these things, or two of these things, whatever. But you have saprophytic fungi, which are your, your, your typical decomposers. They feed on dead organisms or organic waste. This would be like these fairy ring mushrooms here. They're feeding on the decaying grass. Then you have parasitic fungi. This would be like athlete's foot and ringworm. They absorb nutrients from cells that are still alive. So athlete's foot and ringworm are literally breaking down your cells uh, you know, on your skin or whatever that are still living. And then there are mutualistic fungi that live in symbiotic mutualistic relationships with other species. An example would be mycorrhizae, which we'll talk about more in a minute. Okay, so fungi can reproduce asexually or sexually. So a couple of ways that they reproduce asexually is by budding and fragmentation. Now, budding is when you actually have a new cell developing and pinching off from the parent cell, sort of like mitosis. Fragmentation is where you have the breaking off of mycelium that lands somewhere and then begins to grow. So the mycelium gets broken off, lands somewhere, begins to grow. Now, spores are unique because they can be used for asexual or sexual reproduction. So in asexual reproduction, you have a spore developing without fertilization into a new fungus. When spores are used in sexual reproduction, they're haploid, you know, produced through meiosis, and they have to be fertilized. So these spores are a big deal. They're you know, a key fungal adaptation for reproduction and survival. They produce spores at a you know, great rate. They're very small, they're lightweight, allowing them to travel easily. They're protected by a tough, waterproof cell wall. So here are just some, you know, some of the types of fungi that we have. Chytrids were the first fungi. We think they evolved first from protus. Um, you have your common molds, zygomycotes. You have ascomycotes, which are the sac fungi. That includes yeast. You have basidiomycotes. That's what you think of. That's club fungi. So these are the four right here. And then this is the one that you might hear of. Uh, Basidiomycota is a phylum. They produce these basidiocarps, or club fungi. They look sort of like clubs here. And they have basidia, which produce the spores on the underside of the cap. And when we do our mushroom dissection, you'll see all of them. Okay, I do want you to know about symbiotic relationships with fungi and photosynthesizers. And two of those are lichens and mycorrhizae. So what did the fungus say to the algae? I'm lichen you. Lichens are a symbiotic relationship between a fungus and an algae. Mycorrhizae are between fungus and the roots of various plants. 
So a lichen looks like one living thing, but it's actually two living things. It's fungi and algae. So the fungi are providing a place for the algae to grow. The algae are providing usable, usable sugar, so they're you know, benefiting from each other. And the presence of lichens actually tells you how well an environment is doing. Mycorrhizae are when you have fungi growing on the roots of plants, allowing them to absorb more nutrients.